bless this church and let your holy spirit shine in jesus holy name i pray amen, amen. <laughs>
Thank you.
morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to be here at West Union Baptist Church today. And uh, I want to just say that uh, I am enjoying my time serving as the mission strategist for Gordon Memorial Baptist. And uh, we, Carrie and I, have been making our way, you know, we've got a list of, you know, 38 churches, and we've kind of been visiting, you know, one a Sunday for some time now. And I've looked forward to uh, being out here at West Union. And uh, thank you for such a warm, warm welcome today. I, I just want to say, and, and my, that's my wife Carrie back there, and so what, wave at me, Carrie. She's the better half of the deal. That's just it, you know. She is the better half of the deal. We met, uh, we were both in college. Um, I was at Barry, and she was at Shorter. We, we met at... Sorry, I didn't mean to... I'm cutting up. I know, I know. Uh, and we've got some guys back there with ropes for people like you. So, you know, all I have to do is give them a nod and it happens. We've got handcuffs. We've got handcuffs. That's great. Well, Carrie and I, we met in the college ministry at Western Baptist Church there in Rome. And um, so uh, we began to date pretty soon after that. I think. Uh, about November or so uh, of that year of school and uh, been together ever since. And so uh, we have three grown kids. I've got a son uh, and daughter-in-law and two grandsons in the Dayton, Ohio area. I pastored a church up there for a little while. My son went to Cedarville University. Some of you may have heard of that, a wonderful Christian university there, and went to law school. And uh, And so he is a prosecutor in the greater Cincinnati area. And I've got a daughter in Chattanooga. She is a knoll girl, okay? So we were in Florida for 24 years, is that right? At the Riverside Church. Uh, and so uh, she went to Florida State University. Uh, she's not here today, but I know she would appreciate very much if we clarify, not Florida. Florida State, okay, and, and so, and, uh, and you know, the Knowles feel about Florida about like us Bulldogs feel about Florida, and so I get along really well with Seminoles, uh, and, and then our youngest is Caroline, um, Caroline is uh, working at a church as the, in, in the Athens area, she is the director of discipleship ministries for high school girls. Uh, she's our youngest. She's in her mid-twenties. And so uh, we are blessed that all of our kids know Jesus, love Him, and in various ways are serving Him, one on staff. The others are uh, lay volunteers in their churches. And uh, that is the best thing that there is. That's the best blessing there is, is the blessing of family and watching Jesus uh, do what only He can do. Uh, in families. I want to brag on West Union for a moment if I can. I just want to tell you, I already know that when Carrie and I get in the car and leave here, that we're going to be chattering about how warm and open and friendly West Union is, okay? I mean, you guys, uh, you you may not realize it, and you're, I don't think you're plotting to do this. I think it's who you are, Okay. <laughs> And so, if that's who you are, then my goodness, that's the secret to reaching people and, and bringing them into the church. That is the big deal because there's so many people out there that are lonely um, and uh, they would love to feel, and, and by the way, people who don't know Jesus, nevertheless, most of them feel guilty about something. So coming into a church for the first time is maybe one of the most terrifying things that they're ever going to do. Hello? You know? And they don't know their way around and to come in and have people smile and hug their necks and introduce yourselves and just be as warm as you've been. Uh, I can already tell that you're not going to need a whole lot of my help, you know, uh, at West Union. Y'all have the secret sauce here. And I am so 
I'm so blessed to know that. And uh, thank you for making us feel so welcome. Well, take your Bible, if you will, and turn with me to Psalm 13. Over the last 10 years or so, or longer, 15 years, I've been in a long process of falling in love with the Psalms. As a matter of fact, I love the poetic portions of the Bible. Did you know, while you're turning to Psalm 13, did you know that the poetry in the Bible, if you put it all together, makes up a body of material approximately the size of the New Testament? There is a lot of poetry in the Bible. And of course we know predominantly in Proverbs, all of the Psalms, you know, Ecclesiastes, Psalm of Solomon, but also if you go, if, if you have a, 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 a Bible that it has been published, you know, like in the last 25 or 30 years, most publishers of the Bible distinguish between just narrative or storytelling and poetry by the indentations and by how that text is set apart. And you look at it, you know, oh, that's either a song or a poem, which is essentially the same thing in Scripture. And so uh, I am just fascinated by the Psalms, and I'm particularly fascinated uh, because writers, you know, Moses, you know, appears as the writer of at least one of our Psalms. We have Psalms by people named Asaph, and others, but we see predominantly David and uh, his worship of the Lord that is recorded for us. And I find that, you know, in reading and understanding the background, you can go backward into those historical books that cover the life of David. You can read the circumstance. You can turn forward then in the Psalms and knowing what David was in, uh, in, in the middle of in that moment, you can read how he took it to God. You can read his worship out of those circumstances. And as a matter of fact, when I read Psalm 13, that there's a title in my Bible, and I think you have it too. It, it says for the choir director, a Psalm of David. And then do yours say prayer for help? in trouble or something similar to that. Mm -hmm. That tells us a little bit about what, where David, uh, what he's experiencing. And, and one of the reasons I love the Psalms, and I know, I know you're thinking, when is he going to start the sermon? Uh, but you know, Brother K.M. told me, y'all are used to the preacher preaching about an hour. And I want you to know I'm really comfortable with that. So uh, I'm kidding. But uh, don't, look, don't look at him. Uh, but we're going to get going. But, but just know this. When you read the Psalms, you're reading testimony. You're reading testimony. And David, the anointed king of Israel, is experiencing great difficulty when we come to Psalm 13. Okay? And we hear him pouring his heart out to God. Now, as an introduction, sometimes we have people that want to teach us that if you know Jesus, life is one big tra-la-la. Right? Nobody ever has problems. Nobody's anxious about anything. Everybody's children go down the right path. There's never any disappointment in life because you know Jesus and I'll just tell you, that's a big fat lie. Okay? Now that may help you whoop a crowd up, and you can pass the chicken buckets, and people that are happy about that false gospel may put a little money in there. That's me being smart, Ellie. <laughs> but it's not the Bible. And I want us to see that. Not biblical. And I want to read this song, and I want you to just imagine David, the anointed king of Israel, writing these words. Notice he starts in verses 1 and 2. You can look at your Bible. Look at verses 1 and 2. How long, how long, how long, how long? Have you ever asked God, how long? I've been bringing this to you, Lord, for years. It's been in my prayer journal for years. My circumstances haven't changed for the better 
in years. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Because that's part of everyone. Everyone here. All of our walks with God. We're not guaranteed that everything is always rosy. And we're not guaranteed that all of our pains will be healed in this life. Amen? Amen. That God uses them to help us yearn for His glory and His rule and His reign in our lives even beyond the grave. You see? And so they're tools in God's hands. Notice how long, how long. Now I want you to notice that this journey, if you'll look with me in the first part, do y'all see those words how long over and over? Now look, if you will, in verse 6. Look how the psalm ends. It begins with the, 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 the psalmist saying, where are you, God? What are you up to and why and how long am I going to have to be in this state? But it ends with him saying, I will sing to the Lord. And so what, what is this psalm about? It is about the journey from how long to I will sing. More specifically, it is about the journey from how long to I will sing even if the circumstances do not change. Okay? So rather than be overly sneaky, I want to suggest something to you. If the circumstances don't change, then what does? Our hearts. Amen? Let's read this together. I'm going to read the whole thing. David writes, How long, O oh Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my own soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day long? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Well, that's some start to a praise song. Verse 3, Consider and answer me, O oh Lord, my God. Enlighten my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my adversaries will rejoice when I am shaken. In other words, if I fail you, Lord, the enemies will have fun with that. But, verse 5, I have trusted in your loving kindness. I love that. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Can we pray? Father, open our hearts and our eyes, open our mind, our attitudes to what you have for us in this brief little psalm and may it minister to us exactly where we are as we find ourselves today and may it draw us deeper into fellowship with you lord get glory through these moments now that we we spend together with an open bible have your will and your way in our hearts we pray in jesus name amen Amen. Well, uh, I, I want to just talk through this psalm. We've kind of given an orientation. And I have some words of application. Uh, as a matter of fact, all of my points, or whatever you want to call them, is an application of the psalm that we just, uh, we just read. And very quickly, I simply want to say, number one, and this, this may be the hardest one, okay? But we need to learn to accept this season as part of what is common in the Christian walk. We, we don't need to say, what's wrong with me? I'm in such pain. You know, we don't need to worry neurotically about is God holding something against me that I've already, I committed a sin years ago and, 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 and I've already confessed it, but is he still remembered? Is that why... Is that why the, you know, it, it feels like my life has gone uh, astray or why everything, nothing works out for me and why I feel like I'm suffering so much? 
Does God, has God gone from loving me to hating me? No. When you open the Psalter, the collection of Psalms, and you listen to these poems, these songs, these prayers, here's what we come away with. Point number one. <coughs> this experience is common to the life of faith. Believers from time and memorial have been going through the valley experiences. Well, what's the most famous psalm? What do you think? Maybe Psalm 23? And it says, And though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, not death itself, but something dark and mysterious and frightening as death. You see, death is somewhere casting a shadow over this season in our lives. And that is something that is common to anyone who's given their life to Christ and is trying to swim upstream in a downstream world. People who have trusted our eternity into Jesus' hands, but were not yet in that eternity sealed and safe forever. We still have to live down here. You see? We have to live in this world that's just gone off the rails. Do you ever get up some days and think, what in the world happened to my America? Hello? I'm not being political. I'm just saying, it's harder right now to live for Jesus, I think, than ever in the history of our country and all the more with other nations around the world. We can't put our faith in the political system. Listen, if we've learned anything, it is that we worship God, not politics. We engage in mission, right? Uh, and we just can't put the kind of trust in politicians that only Jesus deserves. Hello? You know, I, I, I mean, it's just, I don't recognize the country right now. And I know that things are getting harder and harder for believers, even in this nation. That doesn't mean at all that we should wring our hands and fret, you see, and, and believe somehow some of these lies. And I've got to move quickly, but notice uh, some of the things that we can kind of hear David confessing uh, some wrong thoughts about God, okay? Uh, and so first of all, he says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Now, how many of you think God forgot David? Anointed him and then forgot him? No. What's David showing us? There can be seasons in our life when God feels distant. Every one of us in this room got something that's been on our heart and in our prayers probably for years. And it remains unchanged. Yes. Hello? Yes. That doesn't mean God doesn't care. Doesn't mean God's got His fingers in His ears. It doesn't mean He's literally distant. But sometimes in our frailty, it feels like God has gone far away and that he's not listening. And for me, when I read that in the life of King David, that encourages me because it means that I'm not somehow uniquely warped as a believer. But this is something that we go through. And it's, it's our anxieties and, and our struggles in the faith, God is so much bigger than that. And He's so much stronger than our mere emotion. And so, it, it, you know, He says some things here. How long will you forget me? It began to alter His perception of God. You ever been down that road? I have. I have. Okay? Common in the life of faith. Verse 2, how long... Uh, uh, or latter part of verse 1. How long will you hide your face from me? Is God playing hide and seek with us? No, the reality is that's a sin thing. Sinners play hide and seek with God. Not God with us. 
There's a whole sermon there, but I won't do that now. Verse 2, how long shall I take counsel in my soul? You know what I think that means? I think it means that David is saying, I'm just thinking about this constantly. I'm praying it constantly. I never hear from you, God. Why are you silent? You see, all of my counsel, all of my thoughts, all of this angst, it's just within my soul because I can't find you right now. That's what David, king of Israel, is saying. And he says, with that, I have sorrow in my heart all day. How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Now, there are a number of uh, seasons and situations in David's life when it was a literal enemy, an enemy of the people of God, an enemy of Yahweh, that's the God of Israel, and an enemy to David as their king, and his head was being hunted. I mean, you know, it, it started with Saul, who supposedly was the anointed king. And, you know, at one time, you know, Saul picked up a javelin and tried to spear David with it. And he had to flee. He, he had to flee when his own son Absalom had uh, rebelled against him. And Absalom's men were intent on killing David and paving the way for Absalom, an ungodly man, to remain on the throne and so you can just imagine any of those dark shadows in David's lifespan this thing could have come from those moments uh, in a number of different chapters in David's life and so it is very important that we understand there will be seasons like this they are tied to our finiteness and our sinful nature but they do not signal that God is weak or that he has forgotten, or that in some way he has changed in his love for us. Amen? Amen. God is still God. That's what we learn to say to ourselves when we're in a season like that. And in time, I will learn what he wants me to learn. Number two, I think we need to understand in this psalm that it is pleasing to God when we address all of those burdens and we turn them into prayer requests, we turn them into conversations with God, I believe God is honored by that. I really do. Have, have you noticed that when you've really got a major thing going on in your life, guys, have you noticed that the boys down at the barbershop don't really have the answers for you? Ladies, the, the other people at the beauty shop, they can't help you with your deepest struggles. Can I get a witness? Come on, ladies. I know what goes in in those places. I know what goes on there. I really do. Uh, but, I mean, you know, and it's funny that we, we, t we tend to want to seek everything else. You know, I'm a big believer in counseling. I believe that people sometimes need counselors. I believe that. But sometimes I think counselors and counseling in and of itself has become a knee-jerk reaction, and people go to counseling before they go to the Lord. I believe that is going on to some extent. Now look, I, I know that counseling, Christian counseling, is necessary. Okay, I know that it is, and I have sent people to counseling. I have sat with fellow pastors who are counseling, counselors and, uh, and talked to them myself. So yeah, there, there's a gift that people use and there's wisdom in you know in a multitude of counselors okay there's wisdom in that but you know sometimes we, we need to remember that we need to take what we're going through right now and make it a matter of our communion with our heavenly father and take our burdens and our complaints and our requests and our needs to him and I don't think God is displeased by that I don't think God sees a tearful child of his coming and he says, don't you trust me? What's wrong with you? Don't you remember? No, I think he's got a fatherly heart toward us. And I think he's honored. As a matter of fact, apparently he is because this moment in David's life made it into the Bible. Apparently God's okay with us knowing about this. And so number two, God is honored. God is not mad at us when we 
are in touch with our humanity and our limitations, you see. And he doesn't reject us when we turn to him. He, yearn, <coughs> excuse me, he yearns for that. And so uh, we need to just be more, more careful and we need to be quicker at turning our burdens into prayers than to spend, you know, six months or a year worrying before we make it a matter of our communion with God. That's what this psalm is telling us. Address our complaint to God. And he's honored by that. The third thing I want to say here is, and we're going to see this in the second stanza, if you please, and your Bible may show this, but verses 1 and 2 is a stanza, 3 and 4 is a stanza, and 5 and 6 is a stanza. This edition that I have has a bold number 1, a bold number 3, and a bold number 5 to show that. But there are three stanzas, and we're going to change now to stanza uh, number three. And I want you to, uh, and let's pick up with the last part of chapter two, uh, verse two, and then we'll move on. He says, how long will my enemy be exalted over me? And then listen to the segue. Consider and answer me, O Lord, or I will sleep the sleep of death. Enlighten my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my adversaries will rejoice when I am shaken. You know what David is saying there? He's saying, Lord, I'm the king of your people. You've anointed me to rule and to lead your people. And these enemies that we are surrounded by, by the way, not much has changed, has it? Look at the Middle East today. You know, these enemies, I represent you, God. I lead on your behalf. If I falter, if I am taken in battle, if I in any way embarrass your name, if something happens to me, it's not just my reputation that's on the line, but God, it's yours. And our enemies will rejoice if I don't survive this. And so I want to say number three, in our uh, dealing with our difficulties and our unanswerable questions, we need to remember the glory of God in all of it. It's way better to say, look, I love the Lord, but I don't understand what he's doing. Right? Way better to do that and say, pray for me, you know, than to turn angry and resentful and to do anything that besmirches the name of the Lord. And so I see with my eyes in verses 3 and 4, David is articulating a concern about how this plays out and what that says about the God of Israel. Okay. And by the way, look at your Bible. It, you'll notice several times the word Lord appears, and it's all caps. L-O-R-D, all caps. Every time you see that in the Old Testament, it's not the word for Lord, it is his name, Yahweh. And that's how the translation of his proper name. And that's very significant. We don't pick it up, okay? But you have to understand, here we are, we're out here, West Union Baptist Church. In that world, if you drove over to Rome, they might have a different God. They have these regional deities and regional armies. And if you went, you know, a, a few miles this way, a few miles that way, and so they were Philistines, right? Arch enemies of the people of God. And their, their God had his own name. In fact, you go back to the Old Testament, we read and we understand horrific things about how they worshiped. Uh, infant sacrifice was involved in those pagan deity worships in the Middle East. Okay, what's different about the Jews being there is that the Jews are the first monotheists believing in one true God that's, that ever lived there until five centuries after the time of Christ when Islam was founded. Okay, and, and so uh, th there, is, there is this incredible concern about the Lord, Yahweh, and about his name 
being elevated. And David is concerned about not faltering in such a way that might embarrass the name of the one true creator God of all things. And they were surrounded by a whole bunch of other deities. And I don't even want to talk to you about how they worship because I don't want to do that in a church on Sunday morning. But it was bad, and it involved human sacrifice. Okay? I mean, it was just bad. Newborn babies sacrificed to gods like Molech and Dagon and others. By the way, I love Isaiah, where, you know, the prophet Isaiah is mocking these other deities, and Isaiah, you know, uh, you know talks about <coughs> they carve their own deity out of wood, you know, and we also read, they, they carve their own statue out of wood and bow down and worship it. That's how dumb that is. And then we have stories where when, when the Philistines had the Ark of the Covenant in their possession, we have stories where they brought the Ark of the Covenant in and they would go in the next day and their idol had toppled over in the presence of the Ark. Remember those stories? Oh, those fun. They stand it back up, come in the next morning, boom. Gone again. You know, God was just screaming, I am the one true God. And David says, there's hardly a time like a season of great, thank you, a season of great difficulty. That is a phenomenal opportunity for us to show our faith in God by staying faithful to Him. Not acting like everything is rosy, but just saying God knows and I want to keep trusting Him. Number four, we got two more. Number four, focus on the faithfulness of God. And I want you to see this word. Verse five, he reminds himself, this is the pivot. But I have trusted in your loving kindness. Now, that little word loving kindness in Hebrew is a word that means covenant love covenant faithfulness and it's an absolute reference to when God called Abraham out of pagan worship and, and, and called him unto himself and said I am going to multiply your seed like the sands of the seashore like the stars in heaven I'm going to raise up a great nation, Abraham, uh, from your lineage, and that nation is going to worship me, Yahweh. I am that I am, etc. Okay? The great demarcation in human history was the call of Abraham. Christianity branches off of that. You see? And everybody else on the other side of the branch is what we call the mission field. You see? And, and that we need to preach and teach and, and witness for Christ. And, and so loving kindness is the word in the Old Testament that comes up in every story, in every context where God's people need to remember that what God said He was going to do in them and through them, He will complete. When God says, I'm going to do this, I'll finish it. When God says, I'm going to keep, I'm going to make this pledge to you, we can take God at His word. That's the word loving kindness. And if you think about it in your English Bibles, that, that, that word is all over the Old Testament. I'll go a step further. We're Baptist, right? Woo! We're Baptist, right? Oh, good. Wow, I thought maybe I was in the Methodist church family. But I, I didn't know. We're Baptists, right? We believe, we call it this. We call it once saved, always saved. Right? And there are other ways, there are other sayings for that. Other ways. It, we believe that when a person has truly become a regenerate, born-again believer in Jesus, that we in brokenness gave our hearts to Christ, repenting of our sin, and said, I want to be yours forever and ever. And we also believe that God then made a pledge, a covenant, back to us. Right? And so when we say, I believe that 
And once saved, always saved, what we're saying is, I believe in kesed, covenant love. That's the word. This is the word loving kindness. And so we see in seed form in the Old Testament the doctrine of the eternal security of the believer that comes to full fruit in the New Testament. In this word, loving kindness. And it simply means this. God says, when I make a promise, that's it. I always keep it. You see? God keeps his promises. There's never a time when we need to be reminded of that more. When we're in a season of, of the shadows growing. And I, you know, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You know, and I have this image from Psalm 23 where the shepherd, you know, there's a hill and the sun is setting. And so when they top that hill, it's a lot darker on that side of the mountain than on this side. You, you feel what I'm saying? And I can see that shepherd. <clears throat> I can see, I have an image in my mind in which the shepherd is nudging the sheep to go from the sunny side of the hill to the dark side of the hill. And the only reason they go there is they know their shepherd. They trust their shepherd. Jesus said in another context, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them. Right? They know me. So get the picture. The sheep is moving from light to darkness. And all they really have is the voice of their Savior. Now you can spiritualize that a little bit and stretch that to this psalm and from Psalm 23 to the seasons in our lives when we're not sure what God is doing. Just not sure. And let's face it, uh, we're bold on Sunday morning with our faith, but when the doctor calls us in and says, I'm sorry, it's pancreatic and liver cancer. It kind of feels like the shepherd is calling us from the sunlight into the dark, doesn't it? just feels that way. You see? And, and so, uh, I, I love these words um, as we move through this. When uh, he moves from the, the, I don't want this to defeat me because I don't want the enemies of God to rejoice. And then in verse 5, but I have trusted your promise-keeping love. God's the original promise-keeper. He really is. I've trusted your loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. He may not be there yet in his experience, but his faith tells him there's an end to this darkness. There's an end out there to this pain. You see, I don't know what you're going to do, God. I don't know how you're going to do it. But... You, I think when he says, I've trusted in your loving kindness, I'll give you the Chester paraphrase. God, you've never lied to me or let me down before. That's, that's good, isn't it? And I know that this is a season where you're calling me to trust you all the more. That is covenant-keeping language. David says confidently, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Amen? Amen? Yeah. Yeah. It's not just eternal security, but it is the experience of being secure through our faith in the Lord. I remember reading, uh, there's a, a, a pastor, you might have heard of this name, John Ortberg. And John has written a lot of books. John trained as a counselor and then trained as a pastor and has graduate degrees and in both areas. Pastors very fruitfully and has written, I don't know what Carrie does in 12, 15 books, a lot of books. They're good. John is telling the story about when he was with his mentor, who was a man named Dallas Willard. Some of you may have heard of Dallas Willard's 
uh, writings. He's with the Lord now. And uh, he, he said, I had made an appointment. Dallas was my spiritual counselor, my director, you know. And he said, I, I've traveled to where Dallas was in Southern California. And I, I poured my heart out about all the things that were just so difficult in my life. And what I was looking for was sympathy from my spiritual father. And he said, <clears throat> Dallas Willard, he, when, I, when I was finished talking, he let me finish. And he leaned forward and he said, John, this, I wrote it down beside these verses in the margin of my Bible. This will be a test of your joyful confidence in God. <laughs> oh no nobody wants to hear that when what you're seeking is sympathy but that joyful confidence in God really was the destination that we see in this song because when you get to I will sing to the Lord that's a long way from how long Oh, Lord, how long, how long, how long, how long? Four times in the first two verses. But he lands at, I will sing to Yahweh, L-O-R-D, all caps. Because he has dealt bountifully with me. That's amazing. Is it not? That is amazing. Now, he doesn't say, I will sing to my higher power. Notice that. I will sing to the deity of my choice. So one. And this is his proper name. L-O-R-D. All caps. I will sing to the Lord. Because he has dealt bountifully. With me, And so finally, I think this psalm teaches us that we all need to learn how to praise God in spite of whatever's going on. That's number six. I, uh, I kind of imagine God answering one of my more untrusting or whiny prayers. Not whine, but just whining to God. I have, I've imagined God asking me this question. I've, I've imagined him saying, Tony, if I never, and just put a blank there, if I never do what you're asking me to do, can I still be your God? That's the point of this song. Will you honor and serve me? Ironically, if you talk to atheists and say, why don't you believe in God? The thing that they will say is, there's just too much suffering in the world. Hard to believe there's a God with all of the suffering that I see. If you go to a mature, seasoned saint and say, why do you love God so much? They're likely to say or include because he's been faithful to me in my suffering. <clears throat> Same thing. It builds faith for some. Denies it. Or others. You know, West Union, you are, without a pastor right now, you're in one of those seasons. Um, I, I, I just want to tell you that I am available. I'm not much, but I'm available. Okay. But this is God's church. Amen. Application to the church. God has this. Okay. Don't rush It's hard to do God's will in a rush. 
Okay? God's got this. So just trust that. Believe that. Um, and as individuals, you're going through something. You know, God really isn't the one who's moved. He hasn't abandoned you. He hears it. And he's got it. That doesn't mean, however, that we tie his hands and make him intervene now. There's a journey that God wants us to have because it's better for us as a believer. That's there. And we can spend all afternoon, you can tell your story. We've all got stories about that. Um, I don't have the lyrics with me, but y'all ever heard that modern praise song called A Broken Hallelujah? Anybody ever heard that song, Broken Hallelujah? I love that. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's almost like it, it was inspired by this song. And the writer of that song basically says, this is where I am, this is where I've been, but I give to you now my broken hallelujah. That pretty well says it all, does it not? Let's pray together. I wonder in this room, I know we're a little late. I really didn't do that on purpose. But I'm not real sorry. Uh, but I wonder if there's someone in this room and you would say, Pastor, um, I believe that message in that text was for me. It's hitting me in exactly the spot I'm in. And I wonder if we could just bow our head and close our eyes and give one another privacy, but I wonder if you're here and you'd say, I really needed that today. Would you just lift your hand for a moment and just let, thank you, someone else. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, wow, okay, all right. I knew that because there's so many of us in the family of God who are in that stage of the journey. And so we just, I'm going to pray. Are y'all accustomed to having a hymn of invitation? Is that what you do here? Great. So in a moment, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. If you want to, if it would help you to come and just express that to God, feel free to do that. Um, I wonder if there's anybody in this room and you'd say, Pastor, in all honesty, I'm not confident that I really know Jesus. I'm just not confident of that. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I wonder if you would say, I want to, I'm not going to embarrass you, point you out, but if you would just say, I'm here and I'm filled with doubt. I'm not sure. Maybe you'd say, I've never really trusted him. Pastor Tony, would you pray for me? Would you just lift your hand for a moment? I am not sure that I know the Lord. Father, thank you for an opportunity today to open your word. I thank you, God, that wherever we are, whatever we're experiencing, uh, whatever the sources are of pain or joy at all points in between, Lord, your word has a word for us, and we thank you for that. We marvel, God, at how you were able to inspire such a revelation. <clears throat> I pray today, Lord, that you'd help us to have open and responsive hearts. And uh, God, I pray that we would be nourished and strengthened in our faith because of this song. God, free those who need to respond to do so. We rejoice in what you do and what you're going to do. And we trust you now in these closing moments in Christ's name. Amen. 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 We'll have our hymn of invitation.